Thank you very much. So I wanted to start off by telling you guys a story. In 1848, there was a guy named James Marshall. And James Marshall worked on a lumber mill, and he found a little piece of shiny metal. And he had a boss. His name was John Sutter. So James Marshall took this piece of shiny metal to his boss, John Sutter. Two of them looked it over, kind of figured it out that it was actually not a little piece of metal. It was something more precious. It was actually a piece of gold. So John Sutter had a booming agriculture business at the time, and he knew that if there was gold there, other people were going to come, and he didn't want any of that to happen because he kind of liked things the way that they were. So he wanted to keep it quiet. He didn't want anybody to know about this gold. Uh, obviously, he failed, right? So a newspaper man got a hold of the story, and within the following years, over 300,000 people would come to the West Coast looking for gold. So um, at the time, there was a very small settlement, and it was less than 1,000 people, and it was uh, called San Francisco. And um, the, you know, very few people at the time. Over the next two years or so, it would multiply its population by about 20 times. If you fast forward to now, uh, San Francisco has a population of over 800,000 people, obviously a very booming place. There's a guy who lives there, uh, his name is Matt Mullenweg, who I'm sure you're all familiar with. So in uh, 2003, Matt Mullenweg and his partner in crime, Mike Little, forked a piece of software called B2 and created what uh, we all know as WordPress now. And they didn't know at the time, but uh, WordPress ended up being, you know, for Matt at least, a little piece of gold of his own. And he sort of created unknowingly uh, a gold rush that would follow in, in the coming years and uh, around WordPress products and services and things like that. So uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about selling WordPress products. Um, after uh, Matt created WordPress in 2003, you know, for the following years, nobody really sold products related to WordPress. Um, people were mostly doing client work, things like that. It wasn't until about 2007 that the first products came about, and um, those were premium themes. So there was several authors at the time that were making themes, Brian Gardner, uh, A.D. Pinar, uh, Jason Schuller, and those guys, uh, they didn't know that themes were going to be as big, but they started selling themes and they took off like hotcakes. And they just started selling like crazy. And they created the, uh, you know, they were the first people to start create this sort of premium theme economy. And, uh, you know, on the left we have the first theme ever, which is Kubrick. You guys may be familiar with that if you've been around WordPress for a while. That was the default WordPress theme for several years. Um, on the right, we have the number one selling theme of all time, uh, Veda. It's on Theme Forest. This theme has made over $9 million. Just that theme. That's, yeah. So, uh, so, you know, selling on Theme Forest, of course, the author doesn't get all of that. They give a portion of that to Theme Forest. Uh, the, the Kubrick didn't have any uh, special features, right? Didn't have like a theme options panel, short codes, sliders, anything like that. Uh, Aveda, okay, let's see if I can remember this right. It has like over 100 short codes. It comes with 60 PSDs. It comes with a drag and drop page builder plugin. There's, I think, five different sliders. There's like over, I forget how many color options and theme <laughs> options and all that kind of stuff, right? It's everything but the kitchen sink. So just kind of an interesting comparison there. So I'm going to tell you guys you know, some of the things that we can sell in the WordPress economy themes. right? You may be thinking, OK, I want to sell WordPress products. What about a theme? Uh, let's look at some of the pros and cons of selling themes. Pros, everybody needs one. Uh, you, know, you have to have a theme to run a WordPress site. You don't have to have a plugin to run a WordPress site. You have to have a theme. So that's a good thing, right? They're easy to make. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to make a theme, all you have to do is grab a theme framework, you know, underscores, roots, whatever, fork it, add maybe some theme options, some color pickers, some CSS, put your name on it, and you could sell that as a premium theme. Any price you want, that counts as a premium theme, right? GPL means you can fork anything and, and resell it. There's no customer education. Everybody knows what a theme is. They know how it works. You install it. You activate it. You, you have some options. Pretty easy, right? It's not like making mobile apps with WordPress, right? This is, a, this is not rocket science. So cons, everybody needs one. That's actually a con as well. See what I did there? So um, you, you, that means that if you have a person who buys a theme from you, they're probably not going to come back and buy another theme from you for a while, if ever, right? Because they, they already have a theme. They don't need another one from you. Um, that also means that the, the amount of the market size is actually it's limited. So there's, however, 70 million WordPress sites or whatever it is. That means there's 70 million themes. 
Whereas with plugins, you can have multiple plugins per site, so it's a larger market. We'll get to that in a minute. They're easy to make. That's actually a con as well, because uh, you know it's kind of like the gold rush. That, that's why I'm using that analogy, because themes are, have become kind of a gold rush. Um, gold rush, you showed up with you know, a shovel and a pail, staked out your claim, started digging, and you're a gold miner, right? Themes are the same way. You can fork a theme. All you need to do is change a little bit of CSS. I'm not saying that this is what you should do or this is the best way to do it, but that's all you need to do at a minimal level to make a theme. Anybody can do it, right, with very minimal development skills. So that means that there's a, there's a very saturated market. And this is what happened after 2007. People saw all the money that Brian Gardner and AD Pinar were making. You know, they started Studio Press, Woo Themes, uh, you know, uh, Jason Scholler. Uh, Brian Gardner told a story, I forget what it was. I think it was in the first or second year that he started selling themes. He was already making over $100,000 a month, um, which is just crazy. So the market got uh, very saturated. You know, now there's like th thousands of theme shops, things like that. Uh, buyers are subjective. Uh, you know, if you have a client who wants a theme or somebody who wants a theme, basically they look at it, maybe they go to Theme Forest, browse a few themes, they say, ooh, this one has a big slider with a 3D effect, I want that one, you know? Like that one looks cooler, that, that's the look that I want. Um, and that's the people that are buying themes for the most part, unless you're like a developer. So it's really hard to sell your themes on, you know, uh, the fact that it's coded well or it's accessible or it's translatable, things like that. Things that it really themes should be sold on, it's really just kind of subjective. Um, so that means uh, when you sell themes, you know, it's really hard to kind of keep people around, loyalty, things like that. Uh, pricing has been driven down uh, over the years, just themes have become basically a commodity. And theme f marketplaces like Theme Forest, Mojo Marketplace, things like that have driven prices down. Whatever you think about Theme Forest, doesn't really matter. Now people expect for themes to be 50, 60 bucks. And that's just the way it is. When I first sold my first theme, uh, I sold it for 250 bucks, and it sold actually quite well. And um, later, you know, we dropped the price to 150. But uh, you know, that at the time, themes were kind of seen as something that could be you could charge more for. Now, if you look at something like selling on Theme Forest uh, or any type of marketplace, even WordPress.com, they take a chunk of your sales. It depends on where you are. WordPress.com takes 50%. Theme Forest takes anywhere from uh, I think starting at 70% and it goes all the way down to 30% depending on your sales and everything. But if you think about selling a, a theme for $59 and then uh, Theme Forest you know, takes 50% of it, 40% of it, whatever, then maybe you had some uh, costs and things like that, overhead, taxes. You know, the money that goes into your pocket from that is very, very little, right? Um, so it's really hard to build a business on that. You need a lot of themes. Uh, you need, you know, themes tend to have a, a, a shelf life where, you know, they get really popular at first. You get a lot of downloads, a lot of sales, and then it kind of drops off because it's not the newest, hottest thing anymore. So you need to continually be making new themes, um, unless you have a really solid framework or reputation. But that's really hard to do, you know, like uh, like Genesis or something like that. Good, good distribution is tough. You know, you can sell it on your site. Uh, you can sell it through a marketplace, but it's really difficult just to get a lot of eyeballs, a lot of sales in your product. So, those are some pros and cons of themes. If you're thinking about entering the theme marketplace, those are just some things to think about. Now, um, after premium th uh, premium themes were kind of the big thing, you know, 2007, 2008, um, nobody was really making money on plugins. Plugins at the time were kind of seen as an extension of WordPress core. Some people thought that because they're an extension of WordPress core, they should be free, right? So if you build a contact form plugin or something, uh, that should be free, just like WordPress is free. Also, if you try to sell uh, you know, a contact form plugin, I'll be like, no, I, there's a free one over here. I'm going to use that. I'm not going to buy your plugin. And for a long time, uh, plugins re didn't really make any money. And nobody knew how to sell them. Nobody really figured it out. So it wasn't until about 2009 that uh, plugins like Gravity Forms, um, All-in-One SEO Pack had a premium version. Those were some of the early players in that space. And obviously, the success of Gravity Forms, probably the most popular WordPress product of all time, um, that, that obviously really worked. Um, I think people started to see that they needed more than just a free plugin, where they had kind of unreliable support and updates, the longevity of the company. Plugins started dying off after a while. People were like, OK, I'm willing to pay somebody if I know this is going to be supported for the next five, 10 years. I'm going to be able to email someone about it and get an answer quickly, things like that. Uh, and the premium product started actually being really, really good. So uh, plugins are quite a different business model from themes. So let's look at some pros and cons if you're uh, looking to enter that market. 
So you can have multiple plugins per site. Obviously, that makes a bigger market. People can, you can make more sales from that, right? That's an obvious big advantage. It makes a larger market. Products that solve problems are evergreen. Um, if you look at themes, um, themes, themes don't really, they all solve the same problem, right? So everybody's solving the same problem. So that means that it becomes commoditized, subjective, things like that. With a, with a plugin, it's the same thing as any other product since the beginning of time. It's solving a problem, and if it works well and you do better than your competition, then you will be able to survive uh, for a really long time, right? Um, you can also have better pricing models, you know, free plus extensions like the WooCommerce model. Uh, you can do recurring payments, higher prices, things like that. Uh, so those are definite advantages. There's some cons. Um, solving real problems is difficult. You know, forking a theme and putting some CSS in it is easy, but solving real problems is, is hard. Um, I think if you talk to a lot of different plugin developers, even the successful ones, they've had uh, lots of failures. Like I know uh, my uh, one of my friends, James Laws, he has Ninja Forms. They're they're doing incredibly well now, but they made almost no money for two years. They the first version of their plugin, they had to completely rebuild it. Um, you know, didn't do well at all. There's, there's numerous uh, success and failure stories of, of other stuff. I mean, if you look at a plugin like um, JiggoShop, like JiggoShop was, was out before, you know, so that's what got forked. WooCommerce forked this plugin called JiggoShop, which was this e commerce plugin, uh, and has now become this multi million dollar product, right? And it was basically the same thing as JiggoShop, but WooCommerce took it and executed it better. But you know, Jigu Shop itself didn't do that well, and it was the same plugin pretty much. So like, what what happened there? You know, I don't know. It's it's hard. It takes more customer education. Uh, you know, if it, a theme is very self-explanatory, everybody knows what it does. If you have something that does something crazy, you know, uh, uh, or you know, something that has a lot of extensions and different things, an e-commerce plugin, for example, needs a lot of documentation on taxes and shipping and add-ons and payment gateways and all this kind of stuff and. It's a lot of customer education. Support is, is a lot more difficult as well. You have to pay your support guys better. You have to educate them better. That takes them longer to answer the questions, things like that. So the other thing that you could do in the WordPress space is, is SaaS, it's software as service. And this has, been, uh, this has been something that a lot of people in the WordPress space have been thinking more about recently. And it's been around for a while. I mean, companies like Vault Press uh, have been around for a bit now. Um, it's, it's nothing completely new, but as far as WordPress plugins turning into software as a service, I think that this is something that's fairly recent. <clears throat> like, for example, a good example is uh, Optin Monster. So if you don't know the story of Optin Monster, um, they actually took eight months and built a software as a service to, uh, you know, to release these uh, opt-ins. And they were about to launch it, and they threw, did some rigorous testing, and they basically found out it, was, it wasn't going to withstand the pressures of you know, lots of people using it, and basically just wasn't going to work at all. They couldn't fix it. It was just they had to completely throw it out the window. So after building that for eight months, they took 30 days, and they were like, we're going to build a WordPress plugin. We're going to take 30 days, and whatever we after, after 30 days, we're just going to release it. So that's what they did. They built the fir first uh, version of the OptiMonster plugin in 30 days, became very successful, and I think it's now two years after something like that, after they launched, uh, they have now gone back to the software as service model. Uh, and they actually, they don't, uh, the plugin is not viable anymore, I don't believe. I think you have to use the software as service now. Um, some other examples, manage WP and co-schedule. So the interesting, interesting thing about software as service is that um, it's multi-platform, so you have a really big market. So a lot of us know, I mean, WordPress is 24% of the internet, right? <clears throat> That's a lot. That's a lot of sites. It's, it's many millions, 70-something millions, I think Devin said in his presentation. Uh, but if you think about that, 24% uh, of the internet means that there's 76% of the internet that you can't access, right? So that's 76%. That's the vast majority of the market out there that WordPress is not a part of. Um, so having a much larger market is, means that you can take your company to revenue numbers that you wouldn't have been able to do if you're just selling a WordPress plugin. So this is something to consider when you're starting a business. Um, it's also a controlled environment. So if you have a plugin and you install it in the WordPress admin, so say you add a menu item and you know, a custom post type or a settings page or whatever, 
Um, you basically have the UI that's restricted to you, uh, that's kind of similar to WordPress. You don't know what other plugins they're running. You don't know what server they're on. You don't know what version of PHP they have. All these types of things, are, it's, a, it's very constrictive with the amount of things that you can do. For, uh, so for example, um, I have a plugin that helps people build mobile apps uh, with WordPress. Now, if we made a plugin where we tried to customize the dashboard and give them this really cool app building experience, it would probably break on a lot of different environments and there'd be all these conflicts and it just wouldn't be worth it for us to do it. So we built a software as service platform to where we can actually control the entire flow from beginning to end and it makes it a lot easier for our customers because uh, we can control everything, right? Uh, so it's a better customer experience. So the cons, uh, it's, it's really challenging, um, I've found, with software service. So I started out selling premium themes, um, then started, uh, started selling premium plugins a couple years ago, and then we released the software service about a year ago. So I've gone through all three of these. What I'm finding with software service is that it's really challenging because <clears throat> you have two different products. You have the product that you create, so like take a form, take Wufu. Wufu is an online form builder. They, the product that they're selling is the form, right? But they have an entire other product, which is the form builder, the experience that their customers go in and use to actually build the form. So instead of just making a form, um, they actually have to make the form builder, and they have this whole customer experience that they figure out. So it's basically two different products. So you have to figure out onboarding. Uh, you have to have server costs. You have to do, uh, you know, you have this uptime. You have all this churn and all these kinds of things that you don't normally think about when you're just selling products. Um, one of the really good things about software as service is that you can get recurring fees, which is great. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to build a company on recurring fees than it is on product sales. Product sales tend to go like this, from day to day and from month to month. Um, I mean, it's not unheard of to have, even with a company, my company's fairly small, but I mean, we can have differences in product sales of $10,000 um, every month, you know? And that's, I feel like that's a very small bit. On a bigger company, it could be much more than that. Um, it's really hard to build a company on that because $10,000 could pay two people, you know? So that means there's two employees you can't hire because you don't know if that revenue is gonna be there from month to month. Um, with the software as a service, you do, because you have recurring fees, you know kind of what your base is. Even if a few people cancel, a few people are going to sign up, things like that, it's a lot easier to build a company on. But then you also have people who don't want to pay you monthly fees. Um, you have churn, you have credit cards expiring, um, you know, you have fraud, things like that. So there's cons as well. So, um, excuse me, here. So those are the three different types of products you can make in the WordPress space. Now let's talk about if you've actually decided what type of product you want to make, uh, just the things that you're going to go through as you launch this product. So <coughs> before launch, um, you definitely want to create an MVP. But not that kind of MVP, this kind of MVP. So minimum viable product, I'm sure you guys have all heard of this. Uh, basically, it means instead of making some giant behemoth of a product and then, you know, taking a year and to build it and not showing it to anyone and then launching it with 10,000 features, you want to make the smallest, tiniest little thing you can that's actually viable, that's going to make money that people want, and release that before you do anything else. So the emphasis here is on viable, not on minimum. So you don't want to make a piece of crap and say, and say hey, I was told to build a minimum viable product. Here it is. Uh, bless you. You actually want to make a minimum viable product, which means you want to make some, the smallest piece of software that you can that actually some, uh, solves a problem that people are going to use and love. So uh, this is a good graph by Paul Cortman about that. So another mistake I see people making is keeping everything a secret. And this is something that I'm guilty of as well. I mean, everything in this presentation is mistakes that I've made, basically, which is how I've learned these things. But um, you, want to, you don't want to keep everything a secret. So what you, what you really think is going to happen is you, ha you have this great idea for a product, right? And you think, man, if I tell anybody about this, if this gets out, everybody's just going to drop what they're doing and they're going to like execute on my idea and beat me to market, right? We think people are just going to like take credit for our, de our ideas and man, I can't tell anybody, I got to keep this under wraps, right? You got to sign an NDA if you're going to hear about this and you know, all this kind of stuff. So this is what really happens when you tell people about your ideas. People care so little about your idea, you have no idea. So, uh, I mean, I'm guilty of this as well, but what really happens when you tell people about your idea 
as they say, that's great, man. But they're so busy with their own ideas, with their own work and all this kind of stuff that they don't have time to execute on your idea. Not, not only that, but they don't have the passion that you have for it. You could have the greatest idea in the world and uh, you know, people aren't just going to drop everything that they're doing and take time and execute on your idea. It's just not going to happen. <clears throat> not only that, but a lot of the best ideas don't even sound like good ideas at the time anyways. So um, what I would suggest instead of doing that um, is tell a lot of people about your idea. Get feedback. See what people say about it. You know, get people, even if you don't you know, blast it out to the world on Twitter, um, at least talk to people that you know and trust about it. Um, you know, people who could be potential partners, potential customers, things like that. At least you'll kind of get the word out a little bit. And then uh, once you launch your product, then people will actually kind of be like, oh, yeah, you were working on that. Cool, man. How's that going? Instead of like, oh, you launched a product? Oh, I don't care. You know, whatever. So um, another thing kind of tied to minimum viable product, um, minimal features. It's, it's so important to, to have as few features as possible in your product. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, I mean, every feature you build is uh, it's a liability because that means you have code debt um, when you launch it. Let's say you launch a product with 10 features and people only use two of them. You have eight features now that you have to maintain forever. You most likely can't just pull them out because there's a few people that are using them and you want to be backwards compatible and all this kind of stuff. So that means you have to maintain them. You have to do bug fixes. <clears throat> it's going to affect the way that your product looks, the way that it works, the customer experience on it. So the, the um, you know, you don't want people to get into your product and be like this. Um, you know, oh, look at all these great features, man. Well, cool, I'm never going to use any of those. I just want this thing over here. So the great thing to do is, is to find out what that, one product, what that one thing is that people really, really want and just focus on that. And then uh, launch it and, and then, you know, you can add features later. Um, but once you launch your product, people are going to ask you for all kinds of features, man. They want like everything, everything. Um, but it, you can't just keep, you can't just, when you're small, it's tempting to just build stuff because you're like, yeah, dude, like, I don't have much going on. Like, there's not many sales right now. You want this feature? Cool, I'll build it in. It's only going to take me like, you know, four hours. No problem. Don't do that. Because then you have to maintain that. You have to do bug fixes on that. It's going to be with your product forever. Um, so keeping the features minimal is, is really important. Um, the features that people really, really want that are really going to make a big difference in your product, you'll hear those over and over, and you don't even have to write them down or anything like that. I mean, I heard Jason Freed, who did Basecamp, I heard him say this. Um, he's like, I didn't write down any like, feature requests or anything like that because the, the stuff that people really want that you really need to build, you'll hear it so often that it's just going to be like ingrained in you. You just like really, you know, because you hear it so much. That's the features that you need to build. <clears throat> um, so I want to touch briefly on marketing your product as well. Uh, marketing is something that should happen while you're building your product. It should happen before you launch it. Um, it's not just something where you build the product, you launch it, and then you start marketing. That's definitely the wrong way to do it. Um, <clears throat> there's a few different ways to market WordPress plugins. One of them is uh, getting distribution through the WordPress.org plugin repository. You know, doing like a freemium or an upsell plugin. This is actually a great way to get downloads. Um, if you look at Easy Digital Downloads, you know, obviously this is a very popular plugin, but Pippin gets like over 500 downloads on a slow day. And he had one day where he got like 17,000 or something, which is crazy. I don't know what happened that day. But yeah. But um, so it's a great place. And, and um, I've sold upsell themes through the repository. Um, that also works. Uh, to a certain extent, you can do the same thing with plugins. You know, <coughs> Easy, Digital, Easy Digital Downloads is free, but it has uh, add-ons that are paid. You can also do an upsell plugin, like related posts for WordPress. Um, this is a great plugin, and he just basically has you know little upgrade messages uh, on the settings page and throughout certain places in the plugin. Um, and this does work. It's allowed um, in the repository. There's nothing wrong with it as long as it's not like crazy overt. Um, like, you know, dinging bells and whistles and stuff all the time, but, uh, it, but it, it definitely works. <coughs> so another thing that you can do is, is content marketing. Um, I, a lot of great, really big businesses have been built on content marketing alone. Um, Groove HQ is a sport desk software, and um, their number one customer acquisition channel is through their blog. And, uh, you know, Kissmetrics, I, they were largely built off of their blog as well. Um, there's 
other good examples of this. Quicksprout is a great place to go to see a good example of content marketing. But basically, they just spend a lot of time and a lot, put a lot of effort into their content. And it gets a lot of traffic. And, and they're really good at getting targeted traffic. And um, you know, even though a large majority of the people going to these sites are not converting, um, they have such high traffic that even if you know, 0.02% are converting into paid leads, that's a really big number for them. Um, so a couple good examples of content. If you go to quicksprout.com, they have these awesome guides. Um, they are they're really long, really well designed. They are really great examples of how to do content that stands out. Moz.com has a beginner's guide to SEO, which I really like. Um, the cool thing about content is that it can actually give you traffic in perpetuity. So you, know, you spend a lot of time and effort and money doing this content, which sucks in the beginning. But then like a year from now, you're still getting traffic from it. And in some cases, it's a really large amount of traffic. Um, I did a, back when I used to sell premium themes, I did a theme customization guide. And um, that guide got. Uh, it was something like 10,000 unique visitors a month in perpetuity. And it took me a few weeks to do. It was a lot of work. It took a lot of time and energy. But like, how much you know, is 10,000 visitors a month worth to you? I mean, I think that was worth a few weeks of work um, you know, for years to come. So uh, content is really, really difficult to do. I, I recommend checking out Neil Patel and Quick Sprout. He has a lot of really good information about it. It's really hard to do right. It's really, really difficult and time consuming. But if you do it right, it can really pay off. Um, another way to get traffic and sales is through affiliates. Um, I'm not really an expert in this area. You should talk to Syed Balki if you want to learn about affiliates. But um, one thing that I've learned, is, you know, some businesses can benefit from affiliates. Uh, you really want quality over quantity. You know, just kind of advertising that you have an affiliate program and getting applications in hasn't been real successful for me. Um, because you get a lot of low quality affiliates. But if you get the right affiliates, it can really help. You know, you want to kind of manually build relationships with people and people who have high traffic blogs, things like that. That's really where it pays off. In influencers who have a big audience already, um, striking deals with them can be really beneficial. Um, you want to make sure you have a 30-day hold. You know, you manually approve affiliates to avoid fraud and chargebacks and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 20 to 30 percent commissions are <clears throat> pretty standard in our in our field. So final tips, um, you want to build interest and in not just a product. So a lot of people will just kind of stick their head in the sand and, and write code for months and months and build a product. And that's kind of our tendency. And we don't want to tell people about it because we, we want to have like a big launch and surprise everyone. And um, you know we don't have time for marketing because we're coding and things like that. Um, this is definitely not the best way to do it. What you want to be doing is you want to build interest as you're building your product through marketing and, and word of mouth and things like that. Because if you don't, what can happen is um, you can launch your product and be like, cool, everybody come look at my product. And they're going to kind of be like, oh, that looks cool, but like, I'm busy with some other stuff. But if instead you had gone to influencers and you said, hey, man, I'm building you know, a new forms plugin and it's got this like, little thing that's different about it, what do you think? And they say, oh, cool, man. but uh, you know." I, I think you should maybe add this into it or something. And go, oh, cool, man, I'll, I'll take it into consideration. Then when you launch, you go, hey, uh, remember that forms plugin I was telling you about? Well, I launched it. Like, You want to try it out in beta, things like that. Um, they'll go, cool, man, I really like that. And because they kind of got invested in it early, they'll be much more likely to tweet it out to their followers or write an article about it or something like that. Also, content marketing takes a really long time to have any type of effect. So if you start writing blog posts three months before your product is launched, you will be able to actually like, get some traffic to your blog, get, get some traffic to your site before you actually do it. Because if you start content marketing right when you launch your product, it's, you're not going to have any traffic for a long time. It just takes content marketing takes time. So do it as early as possible. Uh, say, you know, along the same lines, write about what you're doing. If you can't figure out what to write about, just write about what you're doing. Right? Write about the, the code that you're writing, the things that you're figuring out, the problems you're solving. Um, you know, and, and do it as you're building the product, not after you launch. Um, make sure there's a market. You know, big markets are better. You've got to figure out what your goals are. Um, as we talked about, you know, WordPress is 24% of the internet. Uh, themes can only be on, you only can have one theme per site. You can kind of figure out what your market size is with that. If that market isn't big enough for you, then you might want to go software as a service because then you're not limited to just WordPress. 
<clears throat> um, if you're going to do a niche within WordPress, that's another thing. You have 24% of the internet is WordPress. If you are going to make a uh, nonprofit donations plugin like Devin did with Give, then that's you know a certain amount within that WordPress community, right? So you just have to figure out, okay, well, how big is that market? How much of that market can I hit? And is that are, are those numbers big enough for me? Um, so and and focusing is also you know you, you don't want to just kind of go after everyone. You want to be focused as well. Um, if you're interested in seeing how much WordPress companies make, I wrote a blog post earlier in the year on my, on my blog. You can see scottbollinger.com with that rep, uh, URL. Uh, there's numbers from various WordPress companies about how much they make each month. There's a few companies in there who had never released numbers before who are on there. It's interesting. <laughs> interesting to see. Not to compare yourself to them and say, I'm sad I'm not making $5 million a year like Carl, but uh, you know, it's to kind of just gauge different, you know, just, just kind of for your information. So um, Scott Bollinger, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Bollinger, and at Presser.com is my uh, business website. Thank you very much. Yeah, does anybody have questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right? And a lot of times that works. But I know quite a few companies <clears throat> and quite a few startups that started with an idea which turned out really quickly that there was something else minor in there that really the market wanted. Yeah. And their business became that. Yep. So if all of them did the same thing and dropped in <clears throat> everything except the two features that they thought was the market for it. Sure. Would miss, yeah, that's very true. So if you didn't hear him, um, he said, you know, some some startup companies they pivot after they launch because they find out that oh my, I built you know like uh, Instagram. Uh, I believe that they built some whole social networking thing where you could like check in and do all this kind of stuff. And what they found out was that everybody was just using their photo feature, and so they kind of pivoted and made it just a photo sharing app. Um, and if they hadn't built all those features in the first place, then they wouldn't have found out that that's what their customers wanted. That's very true. So yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. Minimum viable means, you know, for Instagram, the viable part would have been just the photo sharing part, but it's impossible to know that before you launch. So yeah, you can't, you can't launch with no features, but um, to me, the important part is getting something out there and getting people to use it and see what they say. Because if all you do is you sit back and you, and you have your head in the sand and you're building stuff, the stuff that you think you want, then you never get feedback until you launch. It's kind of too late at that point um, you know, to kind of figure out what people want. So at that point, you, could, you either have to pivot or you know, strip features out or things like that. It would be much better if you just kind of released something, didn't spend a year building it. Say you spend like three months building something, you put it out, you go, oh, actually, people wanted this other thing. Well, then you fix it, and you didn't like, waste a whole year you know, knowing that you're building something people don't want. So that's a good point, though. Yes, sir. Right, so the question was, how do you price a SaaS? <clears throat> um, pricing is a really interesting thing. Um, it's a whole, I, I'm not an expert on pricing, but one thing I will say is that um, if you price really low just trying to get customers in, you're going to end up with the worst possible customers. And um, it's true in almost everything that you could possibly sell. The people, the, the, the people who buy the stuff at the low price, they want, they, they, they're more needy, they want more stuff for much less money, they're going to be more support, they're going to be more of a headache than if you just charge more. So um, I, have, I, I know the guys who released this software called Kajabi. And um, basically, they launched, and their prices were way above everybody else's. And they became massively successful. And I, I kind of like talked to them about it. And they're like, actually, we, really, we wish we had uh, gone, our prices were higher. Because um, they're like, I think we're going to get rid of our low tier. And you know, there's strategy in having a low tier and stuff and upgrading people and everything. But what I've found is like if you if you try to introduce lower pricing plans just to get people in, it actually it doesn't help you really. If you if you make a product that people want, they will pay you good money for it. And if you have to introduce lower pricing plans because people aren't paying you, that probably means there's a problem with your product, not a problem with your pricing. You know? So the, I, I think for me, like a really good SaaS pricing model, a pricing point is $99 a month because people have to have some money. They have to have a fairly large company to, or, or at least a decent sized cash flow to be able to get in. 
And customers like that are a lot lower maintenance, and they will stay with you for longer. When you get into the lower price points, it's people who are barely scraping by. They don't really have the money, so they're going to pester you every, you know, all the time. Um, and, and they're going to be just more of a headache, and then they're going to cancel. And you'll be like, dang, I just spent like 10 hours with this guy in the last month in support, and he just canceled. You know, it's like, so. Other questions? All right. Yes, sir. Um, do you think you, if you analyze a sector and you produce a product that is faster, stronger, uh, better than the existing product, do you think that can diminish your risk? Or is that thinking still slightly diminishing no, I think if you're looking for a market to enter and you say, well, this market is underserved and the products, I can make a better product than what's out there, I think that's a great way to go about it. Um, I think that's all about execution, though. It's like, can you really execute that much better than this other company? Um, you know, you have to look at, at just analyze different market factors and things. It's a, it's a really tough thing to do, but I do think that's a, a decent line of thinking, though. So, yeah. All right, there's no more questions. Thank you very much.